CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. We're about to hear a story involving a private eye of yesteryear. He's not to be confused with the private investigator we know today, whose work depends so much on all the electronic gadgets of our technological age. No, this man lived in simpler times, back in the post-war 40s. He was really a man of the streets, and in Raymond Chandler's words, Down these mean streets a man must go who is not himself mean, who is neither tarnished nor afraid. Nevertheless, sometimes he gets into trouble along the way. Take his gun, Dickie, under the left shoulder, and get his wallet while you're at it. Sure. Watch your hands, pal. I get nervous. Such a big gun and such a little guy. And what is your name, my friend? Colbridge. Ah, yes. Abner Colbridge, private investigator. Private eye, huh? I thought he was a cop. And what are you investigating tonight, my friend? That's my problem. Are you acquainted with the young woman in green? That's your problem. To find out. Our mystery drama, entitled Blood, Thunder... And a Woman in Green. It was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Fletcher Markle and stars Mandel Kramer. We're going to meet a private eye in the course of a night's work that happened over 30 years ago. Around that time, Raymond Chandler speaking of the fictional private eye, observed, he's a lonely man, and his pride is that you will treat him as a proud man or be very sorry you ever saw him. He talks with rude wit, a lively sense of the grotesque, and a contempt for pettiness. Well, here comes Abner Colbridge. He's no Philip Marlowe, believe me. Just a minor brother in that fraternity of tough guys back in the Marlowe era. A private eye of long ago who's certainly going to need his sense of the grotesque before his story is done. It was one of those nights. You're not doing anything, and you don't expect to be doing anything, and then all of a sudden, you're in a barrel of monkeys. Trouble. This night, with the city trembling under a thunderstorm, the trouble was murder. I heard about it around 9.30. And by 9.35, I was involved in it. It was like this. At 9.30, I was flopped in my room and the phone shouted at me. Yeah, hello. Cold bridge. Well, what if it is? Who's this? Abner. It's Bo Peep. Who? Peep or man there, Abner. Bo Peep. Oh, oh, hello, Bo. I'm sorry. I was half asleep. Settling my dinner. How's the eye of the news? Abner, listen. Fifteen minutes ago, I got the picture of the year. I just got in. The picture of the year. Two years. Five. A gunfight. A murder. And blood like a busted hydrant with dancing girls in the background. Twelve dancing girls. Count them. Twelve. I was out on a story for school. Yeah, and you just happened to be there at the time. You just happen to have your camera with you. Oh, you know me, Abner. I always know where to be. Sure, Bo, sure. I read the dust jacket of your book. All right, right. But it's the picture of the year, I tell you, and the story. Of the decade, Bo. The century. What are you calling me for? Well, I'm coming to that, Abner. Call the papers. Listen, will Call you? your publishers. Maybe they can get it engraved in time for the third printing. Abner. Mail me a print, Bo. I'm sleepy. Abner, listen. Listen. I want you. I want you to come right over. I got a job for you. What's the matter? Can't you get a messenger, Bo? Abner, cut it out. We're wasting time. 
What kind of job? Bodyguard, I am. Bodyguard? Now, let's get this clear, Bo. It's a lousy, rotten, wet night. And I have a failing reputation to maintain as a private investigator. Now, if you're in deep, call a cop. Bodyguard. Yes, sir, please let me finish. Bodyguard for me, investigate for them. They're good for a fat fee, Hampton. Who? Scoop. The picture tabloid. I told you. I was out on a story for them when I saw the gunfight. I've got a murder on film right here in my hand. It's the picture of the year, believe me. I'll believe it when I see it. I gotta develop after. I got no time to argue. You haven't. You just come on over to my place. You know where it is, little certain apartment. I know where it is, Bo, and I'm not interested. You will be. Oh, listen to somebody at the door. It's probably Miriam. Oh, wait till you meet this Miriam Taylor, Hepner. She's a great grass, but she's got a lot of guts. So grab a cabin. Come on over. No. Capital N, capital O. Same old Abner. I gotta get my daughter. I'll see you. Ah. At 9.35, I was down on the street with my gun packed and my tie tied, hailing a cab. I got in and told him to step back, listening to the storm and looking out at the flood of rain on the streets. Bo Peep was the professional label of a crazy little news photographer named Boris Peeper Mendy, whom I'd seen and known around. Our paths had crossed now and then, and we had a drinking acquaintance. Bo's life was rooted in his camera and press card. A collection of Bo's best work called Tabloid Town had just been published and was nudging its way toward the bestseller lists, spreading his fame far beyond the city limits. He was a nice little guy with an uncanny nose for news and a sharp way of impressing people with everything he did. I sat in the cab throbbing with questions. Who had been murdered in the gunfight? And where could it have happened with a background of a dozen dancing girls? And why did Bo need a bodyguard? And since when did a picture paper like Scoop want to employ a private eye? And what was the matter with me that I always made a pretense of turning down jobs that screamed interest from the first hint? Hey, yeah, buddy. I paid him and got out, lost across the sidewalk to the door of the Lucerne Apartments. Wouldn't be long before I got some answers. It was an old brownstone block, smelling of age and onions and rotting linoleum. But Bo had never been able to permit his living habits to keep up with his income. He stayed as close as he could to police headquarters, which was just around the corner. The elevator was up on another floor, and I only wanted the second, so I used the stairs. Little winds were rattling around the stairwell and through the high, hollow halls. One minute the storm seemed vague and remote, and the next minute like another plant coming down through the roof. 219 was a few doors down the hall to the left from the top of the stairs. There were three naked bulbs offering a hard white light at intervals along the hall, and the second one was over Bo's door. The door was slightly ajar, and from under it came a narrow, curling snake of red sparkling in the strong light. Blood. Blood has a way of letting you know that your first guess wasn't wrong. I kicked the door open. Bo was lying half on his side and half on his back on the floor, feet toward me, and the door just grazed his foot on its way in. There was an injured speed graphic with a flashbulb attachment beside his outstretched left arm. His right arm was clutching at a red pulp of stomach where somebody had done terrible things with a knife. His body was warm, but he wasn't alive. I stepped back and looked up and down the hall. No one. I re-entered the room and closed the door behind me. I thought of Bo saying that he wanted a bodyguard, that there was no time to argue, that he had to develop and that there was somebody at the door. It was a big room with a double bed and a side table with a telephone on it, a chest of drawers, an armchair, 
Another smaller chair, a bookcase piled with magazines and newspapers, and a table loaded with cartons of flashbulbs and camera paraphernalia. The walls were covered with Bo's pictures, glossy prints and clippings, and a huge enlargement of Bo holding his speed graphic that was obviously a self-portrait taken in a mirror. There was an alcove kitchen in one corner and a bathroom between it and another alcove heavily curtained. Bo's dark room. I gotta develop, Bo had said. I crossed the room and switched out the overhead light. Stepping across the body, I felt my way around the bed to the alcove curtain. I pulled it back, and then another curtain behind it. And a soft glow from a colored light revealed shelves of bottles and boxes of paper. Enlarging and printing equipment. And a row of white trays on a table. The trays were empty. Then I heard a door closing in the front room. There was a tall man in a tuxedo standing at the door, smiling at me through a small beard. And there was a gray-faced kid in a brown suit standing behind him, pointing a thirty-eight at me. Good evening, my friend. Hello. This is a rather sordid scene of crime and passion, is it not? Your hands up very high, please. Watch him, Dickie. I'm watching. Just what the devil is this? A good question. He has a gun, Dickie, under his left shoulder. Get it. Sure. And his wallet while you're at it. Uh huh. Watch your hands, pal. I get nervous. Such a big gun and such a small guy. I'm not surprised. Now listen, you. Dickie, restrain yourself. Now then, my friend, let us introduce ourselves. My name is William Shakespeare. What's yours? Sherlock Holmes. And that's little Bo Peep on the floor behind you. What do we call this fumbling gunsel of yours? Huckleberry Finn? Very funny. You want any of his stuff, boss? I'll take the wallet, Dickie. Just put his gun on the table. You look rather foolish with one in each hand. As I was saying, my friend, the name is Shakespeare for business purposes. Just as our deceased companion called himself Bo Peep for his business purposes. What concerns me now is your name. Colbridge. For almost all purposes. My card's in the first flap of the wallet there. No need to mess up the rest of it. Ah, yes. Abner Colbridge. Private investigator. A private eye, huh? I thought he was a cop. And what are you investigating tonight, my friend? The distressing demise of Mr. Bo Peep. I wasn't. I am now. Oh, this is taking time, boss. Let me... Make have... use of the time, then, Dickie. What did we come here for? Give me your gun. I'll watch Mr. Abner Coleridge. You collect the film. Uh, sure. Get everything in sight here and everything in the dark room. If it's been developed, cover the tray and we'll take it with us. <laughs> it would be amusing to see Mr. Peep's work. The trays are empty. Check that, Dickie. Yeah, I'll check everything, boss. You are somewhat familiar with the circumstances, I gather, Mr. Coleridge. Somewhat. Are you acquainted with the young woman in green? Well, I might be. It depends. There are a lot of women in green around. It's the season for green. This young lady is unmistakably worthy of that description. Green hat, green dress, green shoes and accessories, and red hair. Lovely red hair. It may seem a peculiar combination, but I assure you it's exceedingly becoming in her case. Do you know her? Maybe. Nothing in the dark room. Very well. Collect all the other loose film in here. Gotcha. Are you uh, <clears throat> investigating alone, Mr. Colebridge? I might be. It depends. You're being rather difficult. So are you. May I drop my hand? Certainly not. I'm ready, boss. Let's blow. Have you got everything this time, Dickie? Yeah, it'll work. It's all on the table here. You, uh, you want to answer that? No. Yes. Why not? Quiet, both of you. Hello? Hello? Is that you, Bo? Is this Mr. Beaver Mender's apartment? Hello? Phone number. I, uh, I think that was our young woman. Oh, let's get out of here, boss. The cops are liable. Hey, look out, oh, Dickie. He's diving for his gun. Sap him, Dickie. Sap him. <laughs> Dad! Well, as Raymond Chandler said, some private eyes have no more personality than a blackjack. 
But when the latter hits the head of the former, it's not really a question of personality, is it? It's simply a question of survival. And we'll find out how Abner Coleridge survives when I return with Act Two very shortly. Abner Coleridge, a private eye at work in the post-war 40s, has answered a phone call for help from a photographer friend whose professional name is Bo Peep. Bo claims to have just taken a most unusual photograph, so unusual that he wants Abner to act as his bodyguard while he develops it. But by the time Abner gets to Bo Peep's apartment, his friend is dead, murdered. And there is no trace of the photograph in Bo Peep's dark room. Two rather sinister strangers arrive while Abner is searching the apartment. While attempting to outwit them, Abner is put out of commission by a well-placed blow from a blackjack. Whatever it was the kid hit me with, he hit hard. And the floor came up to meet me. I saw a few thousand women in green with red hair, and they all looked like those distorting mirrors at amusement parks and penny arcades. I saw William Shakespeare, the old and the new. The only difference was that the new one was wearing a tuxedo. I saw stars, and I felt my nerves stretching like licorice. I smelled a thick, sweet smell and tasted the salt of sweat. Then I saw 12 dancing girls, count them, 12, and they were on a billboard, and I saw them from the back seat of a car that was turning into an alley, and I heard a familiar voice. That fool Pete must have been standing right about here when he got the picture. I was positive that I was conscious for a minute, then I blacked out again. to a chair in a large, expensively furnished office. I could see several vague shapes in front of me talking indistinctly. I could hear music somewhere nearby, sounding like a dance band. My coat and shirt were wet and cold against my skin, and the back of my head felt like overtime in a steel mill. And somebody threw a glass of water in my face, and I knew why I was wet. <laughs> hey. Is she coming out of it, I think? It was about time. You must have knocked him plenty, Dickie. Once, Sugar. Once I knocked him. I do it right. All right, let me talk to him, Sugar. There, my friend. Are you with us again? Oh. Hey. Are you back with us again, my friend? Oh. Nah, he's still out. He's faking. I'll tell him we don't buy it. Yeah. Leave him alone, Dickie. Want him to pass out again? Go sit down, kid. You're in a way. Boss wants to talk to the guy. Okay, sugar. Okay, I was only trying. Where's Carl Dickey? He's still out front, I guess, looking for that dame in the green dress. Well, find him. Tell him to get the first aid kit. It's probably in the men's room. Everybody's right. Quickly. Oh, sure, sure, boss. Sure, sure. You want me to bring Carl and the kid? Yes. I let my head sag forward, chin on my chest so I could open my eyes just enough to look the place over without either Shakespeare or the other flunky seeing what I was doing. The office had a big desk and some more chairs like the one I was tied to. A portable bar, no windows, no closets, and only one door. The one going out to where the music was. I closed my eyes all the way when I saw Shakespeare walking toward my chair. I could feel him staring down at me, probably wondering whether I was faking or not. I tried to appear unconscious for his benefit and tried to stay fully conscious for mine. It's been quite a night for us all, Sugar. First Sammy, then Mr. Bo Peep. Now this one. What did you do with poor old Sammy, by the way? Just what you told us. We loaded Sam into the trunk of his car and drove it to the other side of town. Left it in the parking lot. Uh, what are your plans for this week? I haven't decided yet. I'm not sure where he fits in between the photographer and that young woman in green. What is her name, by the way? 
Uh, it's pale, I think. Yes. Yeah. Well, I have the impression this one is involved with her somehow, as well as with Mr. Bo Peep. Well, you know what they say about dead men, boss? Right so, yes. So the only thing that worries me is how many tales this one may have told before Dickie and I ran into him tonight. We can always run over him, too, don't forget. You are not listening to me, sugar. I want to keep him alive and well for the time being. Oh. Hey, you hear that? I don't know how well he is, but it's a sin she's still alive. Yes, but first we need that first aid kit. He's bleeding heavily back here where Dickie knocked him, as you put it, with his blackjack. So, what's the big deal? The big deal, Sugar, is that I'm worried about who this man might have talked to about that photograph. It's very clear he knows something about it. He was in Bo Peep's dark room when Dickie and I first bumped into him. And he knew the developing trays were empty. You think maybe he's got the film? No, we searched him before we brought him over here. Think maybe he knows where it is? Is that what you mean? That is exactly what I mean. Then we need to talk to him some more. Don't we, boss? I tried to look as limp as a bag of dirty laundry while Shakespeare was getting his drink. I tried to figure out how to stay alive by asking myself some of my own questions. Had I really seen the 12 dancing girls on the billboard from the back seat of the car that brought me to this place? And had I really heard Dickie's voice talking about where Bo Peep was standing when he got his picture? Or had I been delirious from the pain in my head? Most of all, where was I? Did the music I could hear have any connection with the dancing girls in Bo Peep's photograph? Here we are, boss. Carl and the kit. Sorry to keep you waiting, Chief. I... Oh. Now I see why you wanted the kit. You want me to... Just give it to me, Carl. Put it on the desk here. Sure. How's he doing? Guy's coming out of his slush of iodine on a scalp to bring him around. Did you find her, Carl? Miss, what's her name? Taylor, boss. Oh, the dame in gray. No, no, she left in a cab about a half an hour ago. But we must find her. Don't you understand? She may know about the picture. I'll take it easy, Chief. She left word she'd be back. And I've told everybody out front to send her here to the office as soon as she turns up. Anyway... How could she know anything about the picture? She was in here talking to me at the time. She might have heard the shots. Don't forget the storm, boss. Right. If anybody heard the shots over all that thunder, we'd have had a visit from the cops long before now. You know, you're quite right, Carl. Yes, yes, of course. It's... It's been rather a disturbing evening. Now then, what about the film we brought back from Bo Peep's place? Marty's taking care of that. It's being developed by a friend of his, a guy we can trust. Marty's with him right now, and he'll call us on the private line after he's checked everything out. Good, 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 good. Well, now let's get back to our friend here. Where's the iodine? Oh, right here, boss. You want me to slap some on? Yes, go ahead, sugar. Pale, isn't he? Ah, uh, he'll be all right. Oh, you sure knocked him, Dickie. Look at this mess. One sugar, one shiners. Uh, here goes. Yeah, water, Dickie. Sure, ready and waiting. <coughs> uh, that's more like he's coming around. Let me try something. Uh, you're going to be all right, Mr. Colbrick. The pain will go away and you'll be feeling better very soon. But right now we need some information. You know Mr. Bo Peep, don't you? Uh, yeah. Yeah, Bo, Bo's dead. Yes, he's dead. We all know that. Now, we're all friends here. The point is, did he talk to you before he died? Did he talk to you on the telephone? Uh, telephone? Yes, 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 yes. Telephone. Did he talk to you? Did he tell you about the photograph? Uh, the photograph? Yes, exactly. A photograph. A picture. I think he must have been quite pleased with it. Did he tell you anything about that picture? Anything at all? Anything? Anything about what? I think he's faking. Shut up. Let the boss do the talk. Tell us what you know, Mr. Colby. It's extremely important to me. You. I... I know you. Of course you know me, and I know you. But what about that photograph? Did Bo Peep tell you anything about it? A picture of a shooting, wasn't it? The killing. Yes, Sammy. Sammy. Did you say Sammy? Aye. 
I ain't no boss, Sam. Quiet, all of you. Very quiet. Now, what about Sammy, Mr. Colebridge? What about him? Died. Died. Did you say Sammy died? Died. Died. You got me tied up here. Oh, damn. It was just a coincidence. He couldn't have known about Sammy. I know you. You zapped me. What'd you zap me for? What's this all about, Shakespeare? What am I doing here? Ah, what a fool. You said it, Chief. He's bloody in more ways than one. Now listen to me, Shakespeare. Put the gag on him, sugar. Yes, yeah, sure, sure, boss. <laughs> Give me that napkin on the tray there, Dick. Is it big enough? That old dog. You're going to be sorry, Shakespeare. You do that. <laughs> <laughs> I'll take him for a while. It's nice and tight. I'm sorry we took the time to bring him here. He's more trouble than he's worth. Why did you bring him, Chief? Because I wasn't certain enough of what he knows or doesn't know to either leave him there or kill him. Don't you think one corpse is enough? That's what started all this, remember? Unfortunately, Carl, there are now two corpses. Two? You mean... I mean the photographer, of course. Dickie had to dispose of him the first time he went after the film. We'd followed him to his apartment in my car. Dickie went up alone and knocked at his door, right, Dickie? Oh, just... Just following orders, boss. He could hear Mr. Peep inside talking on the phone to someone named Abner, who later turned out to be our friend over there. But he kept right on knocking at the door. Mr. Peep finally answered it. But he put up a fight. Dickie had to use his knife on him. Right, Dickie? Well, I didn't have no choice, boss. I, I, I told you that. Regrettably, however... Dickie complicated things even further by only taking the film that was in Mr. Peep's camera. Later, when we discovered it hadn't even been exposed, I had to go back to the apartment with him. That's when we ran into our friend Mr. Abner Colebridge in person. If you ask me, Chief, I'd say you're talking too much in front of our friend over there. Yes, yes, yes. I'm always talking too much. Well... I think Mr. Colebridge will have to go anyway. Well, now, listen, Chief. This isn't the old days. Don't get too carried away. Oh, hi, Mr. Shakespeare. Uh, were you looking for me? Uh, yeah, yes, 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 indeed I was, Miss... Uh, Taylor. Uh, Miriam Taylor. Yes, do come in, Miss Taylor. Thanks. Miriam Taylor was wearing a floppy green hat, a green dress, green shoes and accessories, and a lot of long red hair. She was very pretty. She frowned a little when she saw the bound and battered mess that was me, but she didn't say anything. Just sat down while one of the flunkies lit a cigarette for her. Shakespeare was watching her intently. Cat and mouse. I wished I had learned how to pray. So far, we've had our share of blood and more than a little thunder. And now, at last, we've met the woman in green. Poor Abner Colbridge, our frustrated hero, is fit to be tied. And yet, being tied as well as gagged, he's not really fit to cope with the arrival of our heroine. There's always the possibility, of course, that Miss Taylor may not be a heroine at all. We'll find out more about that when I return with Act Three right after this. Thirty years ago, when World War II was over, we thought we were living in the best of times. But crime is always with us, in good times or bad. And even though we didn't have sophisticated bugging devices to invade our privacy back in the 40s, we still lived in the shadow of blackmail and the black market, and there was plenty of work for a private eye. Which brings us around to Abner Colbridge, our hero with a headache from a blackjack. So there I was, tied to a chair with a gag in my mouth, unable to do anything but wait and see what was going to fall into place between Shakespeare and his three flunkies and the young woman in green. Miss Miriam Taylor was just sitting there ignoring me, calmly smoking a cigarette and making small talk. 
when her name fell into place in my head from Bo Peep's phone call earlier that night. Besides, there's somebody at the door. It's probably Miriam. Oh, wait till you meet Miss Miriam Taylor after. She's green as grass, but she's got a lot of guts. I was just wondering whether it had been Miriam Taylor or Dickie at Bo Peep's door when the small talk in the office was interrupted by the telephone. I'll get it to you. Hello. Yeah, Marty, this is Carl. What's the word? Uh huh. Uh huh. Nothing else, huh? Oh yeah, he's right here, Marty. I'll tell him myself. I'll see you later. Well, don't stand there just shaking your head at me, Carl. Tell me what he said. Somebody's wedding, two conventions, and a lot of pinup girls. Nothing else, Chief. Nothing at all. Nope. That was it. Dickie. Yeah, boss? Step outside on the balcony, please, and stay by the door. We don't want to be disturbed. Gotcha. No more visitors, Dickie. Is that quite clear? I hear you, boss. Now then, Miss Taylor, how are you getting along? You and your, uh, your photographer. Oh, we've got the makings of a good story, Mr. Shakespeare. But I just can't figure where Bo Peep's got to. I haven't seen him for hours. Is that so? Have you been looking for him? Oh, sure. I, I, I called him at our office, and I called his apartment, and <laughs> he wasn't there. What do you suppose has happened to him? I just don't know. He must have gone out on another job. We we only hire him by the hour for an assignment like this, you know. And there wasn't any definite time set, except for the big show at midnight. And it's almost midnight now, isn't it? Right, so. But you were out for a while, too, weren't you, Miss Taylor? Well, yeah, yes, yes, I was. I had another assignment myself. <laughs> they keep us busy these days. So it would seem. Did you know that uh, we had a little trouble here tonight, Miss Taylor? Trouble? No, no, I didn't. Yes, yes. We've been trying to locate a picture, a very valuable photograph. And this gentleman trussed up in the chair here has given us quite a spot of bother in connection with it. I, I, I didn't notice him, of course. Do you know who he is? Why, no. I, I've never seen him before. But surely his presence must have aroused your curiosity when you came in a few minutes ago. <laughs> Yes, yes. I, I, I'll admit I was a little puzzled. I, I mean, he looks so, uh, so miserable. <laughs> but I don't want to ask any questions. Oh, come now, Miss Taylor. It's part of your business to ask questions. I'm surprised at you. Well, after all, Mr. Shakespeare, there's a difference between public matters and private matters. I mean... I, I think it would be a most excellent idea if you did question this gentleman, Miss Taylor. Have a little chat with him. Interview him, shall we say? Hey, the storm's going to break in about five minutes, boss. Don't you want to come out and take a look at things? Yes, indeed, Dickie. We'll be right there. Gotcha. Now, look, Chief. You're not going to leave these two here alone, are you? That's carrying all this a little too far. Never mind. I'll take off his gag, sugar. Yeah, but listen, boss, you Don't can't just... tell me what I can't just, sugar. I know exactly what I'm doing. Take it off. Okay. Now, gentlemen, we are going to leave Miss Taylor and Mr. Colbridge to themselves for a nice little chat. Are you out of your head, Chief? That's his name, Miss Taylor. Abner Colbridge. Now, sugar, come along. If you don't watch out, you're going to blow this whole thing wide open. I said never mind, Carl. Hurry along, sugar. Go on, go, boss. Well, you say. That's right, sugar. Call us if you need us, Miss Taylor. We'll be right out here on the balcony. But please, Mr. Shakespeare, I don't understand. Just call us. I don't understand either. But don't say anything. It's some kind of trick. They must be listening. I thought you must be Abner Colbridge when I... Shh, 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 shh. Don't say anything. They must have a way of listening or Shakespeare would never have left us alone here together. He's after a photograph. And he's desperate. He's trying every angle he can think of. That's a heavy door. Who can eavesdrop? It's also the only way out of here. I know that. But this place is almost soundproof. Is there a dictaphone or any kind of intercom over there on the desk? Uh, no. No, nothing at all like that. Uh, j just a couple of telephones. Either one of them off the hook? Nope. There's just no way they can hear us. 
Anyway, I'll whisper. It's got to be a trick of some sort. Now, be careful. This is life and death stuff along about now. I know it's life and death. I've seen a sample of the death. I made a terrible mess of explaining myself a minute ago on purpose. I wanted to get involved. I came back here with that in mind. What's this all about? Where are we? And who are these people? And what was the picture Bo Peep got that caused all this? Who was murdered in the first place in the wall? Let me tell you. I've been waiting to talk to you for almost two hours. Ever since Bo said he was going to call you. How did you know he called me? Because he called me first. Now, shut up and listen, Colbridge. Call me Abner. You're probably the last person who ever will. My name's Miriam. Taylor, yes, I heard. Who are you? I work for Scoop, the picture tabloid. I came here tonight with Bo Peep to do a story on... Came it. where? Where are we? We're in the upstairs office of a new nightclub called The Tempest. It's owned by that maniac who calls himself Shakespeare. The room we're in is on a sort of balcony overlooking the dance floor. And that's opening night you hear out there. Shakespeare's real name is Bulwer Townsend. And he's a six-faced crook who brought an elaborate black market system over here from England five years ago. <laughs> he's been cleaning up, of course, during the war. And now that he's out of one business, he's bought himself into another. And where did you get all this information? From Bo Peep tonight, before... Before oh, that poor little guy. Yeah. All right, go on. Well, well, we hired Bo to do the pictures on a story for the On the Town page. He knows everybody. Anyway, this club, The Tempest, gets its name from a routine they're going to have at midnight every night. They turn on the wind machines, rattle a thunder sheet, and drop... Confetti and the dance floor rocks and the band plays stormy weather. Uh, that's what they're out there waiting for right now. That or listening to us. Now, what about this picture Bo had that they're all so anxious to get hold of? I'm coming to that. When Bo and I arrived here tonight and the real storm was on, Bo figured he ought to get a few outside shots of the club. A good angle, I thought, seeing the Tempest inside and out. <laughs> And, and he was around the back in the alley, taking pictures in the lightning flashes, when he accidentally got the gunfight. What gunfight? Bo Peep told me on the phone. The way I understand it, that maniac Shakespeare and his former partner had a shoot em up out in the alley. A gunfight. They'd been quarreling for weeks, Bo said. And lucky little Bo just happened to get them in a shot he was taking of the old dancing girl billboard out there. Billboard? Tell me more. It belonged to the club that was here before Shakespeare took over and remodeled the place. Then I did see it. Well, everybody's seen it. Huh, but not with a murder taking place in front of it. Bo took off like a rabbit, of course. Scrambled over to his place with a roll of film, phoned me, and then you. He wanted to have everything set up for the cops to walk in. A scoop for Bo Peep and a scoop for Scoop. <laughs> and he wanted your protection, I guess. I, I, I figure he just never thought about being followed. Well, what happened to the picture? I'm getting to that. Well, get there faster. <sighs> Bo said he'd call me back at the club here as soon as he got the film developed to let me know if it was any good or not. I was getting interviews with everybody here and looking for angles. Come on, come on. No, I waited and I waited and he didn't call. And there'd been plenty of time for Bo to develop and know if the negative was any good. Even if it wouldn't be dry enough for printing. So I called him. Somebody answered and let me prattle on for a minute and then said, wrong number. But I knew it wasn't a wrong number. I know the sound of a ring on Bo's phone. There's a catch in it, like a hiccup. I know. I was there. You were there? With Shakespeare? Yeah. We'll come to that. Now, wait a minute. How did you know it was Shakespeare? I'd been talking to him, getting an interview, only an hour or so before that. You mean to tell me you wouldn't recognize that voice? A double take, maybe, but you'd recognize it. All right. All right, go on. Well, I called again a couple of minutes later, and there was no answer. 
I knew something was cockeyed somewhere. So I went over there. I was actually sick when I saw him on the floor. I know what you mean. That's when I called the cops. They're just around the corner from Bo's place. I know. And they came, and I, I told them all about this, what, what I've been telling you, and, and that's about it. But what about the film? Shakespeare didn't get it. I haven't got it. Have you got it? Listen. Hey, there's the artificial store. Pretty fancy. Tell me about the film. Can't you guess where the film was? Now, don't be cute. I haven't the faintest idea where it was. Under Bo's body. The cops found it when they moved him after the coroner was through. You mean they've got it now? It's probably been developed by now. Oh, God, I'm exhausted. Listen, what are you doing back here of all places, Miss Taylor? Miriam, you're crazy to come back here. Well, relax, will you? The place is surrounded. Droves of cops. You're as safe as your bank account. <laughs> I came back here to follow the story from the inside. But what are they waiting for? What are they... Settle down, mister. They're waiting for the picture, that's all. They found Sammy Walston's body in the trunk of his car an hour ago. Sammy who? Walston. Shakespeare's partner. The guy who got the belly full of lead in front of the dancing girls and started all this. Oh, sorry. Correction. <laughs> I guess Mr. Shakespeare started all this. Well, it certainly isn't ending up the way he wanted it to. Do you have any idea at all why he left us alone together in here? Who knows? Oh, maybe he thought he'd find out if we were, uh, what is it they say in um, detective stories? In cahoots. Maybe he thought I'd untie you so we could try to escape. And then they'd nab us out on the balcony. <laughs> Maybe he was just so desperate he didn't know what else to do with us. I feel like a fool. You aren't a fool. You're just in the wrong business. music. <laughs> they developed the picture. Well, I'm telling you, will you? With pleasure. And we need to get you a doctor. <laughs> oh, you'd better come into the newspaper business, mister. The public eye is a lot safer than the private eye. And so, as Raymond Chandler said, a private eye must always have a lively sense of the grotesque. Especially if he's going to have to play second fiddle to a third party who happens to be a lady from the fourth estate. Not to mention having to let the cops rush in to do his work for him. Oh, well. Maybe he needed to have a night off, just like the rest of us. I'll be back shortly. beginning and between the acts of our story, we included a few quotes from Raymond Chandler. And I'd like to round things off with just one more. All men must escape at times, Mr. Chandler once said, from the deadly rhythm of their private thoughts. It is part of the process of life among thinking beings. It is one of the things that distinguish us from the three-toed. Unquote. Our cast included Mandel Kramer, Jackson Beck, Patricia Elliott, Robert Dryden, and William Griffiths. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by True Value Hardware Stores and Buick Motor Division. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams.